My name is Athena Hollins, and I am the representative for District 66B in St. Paul. We've brought you here together to share the priorities of the People of Color Indigenous Caucus and to introduce myself and Representative Esther Agbaje as the new Posse Caucus co-chairs. Let me first say it is intensely humbling to take the reins from two amazing representatives, Hodan Hassan and Samantha Vang. They've provided some tremendous shoes to fill. And we are forever indebted to Chair Rena Moran for creating the Posse Caucus six years ago. Today, we have the largest number of Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, or BIPOC, legislators serving in the history of the state of Minnesota. And we only expect that number to grow. We see ourselves as representing not only BIPOC individuals in our own districts, but across the entire state. With that in mind, we aim to provide leadership and guidance to our white allies within the legislature, as we may represent divergent perspectives on policy issues. We intend to purposefully build coalitions with the goal of creating more equitable systems to advance the well being of BIPOC communities everywhere. And finally, we will be applying a targeted approach to each of our collective focus areas, public safety, education, and housing. I'd like to turn the mic over to Representative Hodan Hassan to discuss our priorities in the area of education. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for being here with us. My name is Hodan Hassan. I am a state rep from South Minneapolis, uh, District 62A. It's an honor to be here with you guys today. Um, while we know that you know disparities in education have skyrocketed during the pandemic, um, we, our plan is that we address the education disparity that has left many of our students behind. We know that education, having a good education and building your foundation is a, pro, you know, a recipe for leading a productive life. So it's our intent to make sure that we remove systemic barriers that have left and excluded our students. We wanna make sure that our education system is an inclusive uh, system that is holistic and that can address all, all young people's needs. And it's also a matter of you know, economic economy. If you think about it, there are a lot of young people who are from the PIPOC community in schools today, about 30 something percent, I don't know the exact number. And if all of those young people can get the education outcomes that they need to join the economy, we will have a stronger economy. So even with, you know, with, if you don't think about the morality of like doing the right thing, it's about uh, economic um, idea and how to boost our economy. Our education outcomes will be addressing, number one, all the COVID needs and all the things that have happened during COVID. And number two, it will be, uh, you know, putting more money and uh, passing policies uh, from the teachers of color and, and American Indian teachers uh, that we passed last year. And it will also, uh, will also address mental health, which we know mental health and chemical health are a real problem. As you guys know, more people died, more young people died because of opioid in the year 2020 than ever before. So um, with that, I will pass it down to Ramsif uh, Kalihar. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hassan and uh, Hollins and Agbaje for your leadership. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about our uh, housing situation. We all, as a group, understand that we are as complex as people. We are complex as people, which means that the solutions that we're solving for are complex as well. We understand that in the state of Minnesota, we have one of the largest home ownership gaps uh, in, in the country. This is, however, is, is this experience. Um, is not this, uh, this disparity is not experienced equally by all, that we do know that Minnesota, the highest disparities in home ownership in the country with 76% of white households owning a home and less than 23% of African-American uh, black households owning a home. We know that this exists and, and all the disparities that we speak about, whether it's in education, it's wealth and income, it all stems from somebody's ability to have safe and stable housing. And if you are not housed, whether you are renting and being protected as a renter or whether you own a home, 
your child does not have a secure place to study, a stable place to study. You are unable to secure jobs if you are not in secure housing and you are, uh, you are homeless or are constantly moving. You are unable to manage your health and the disparities in health continue to grow if you do not have a home. That uh, your ability to create a safe and uh, stable place for your entire family, because we do live in multi-generational households, that how do we create spaces in which we are protecting people and whatever they see as their home. We as a posse caucus are going to be pushing for greater investments in home ownership, in homelessness, in uh, housing stability. We're looking at this from all different angles. Uh, Representative Egbaje and Hassan have been champions with me in working on uh, and ensuring that we are protecting renters and ensuring that their, their rights, especially during the time of pandemics, are uh, being protected. But we are also looking at programs in which we're going to increase the home ownership rates. We are looking at ways in which we can protect existing affordable housing so that new families who are trying to get into home ownership can have access. There are many things that we're looking to do and we're looking at it from an intersectional approach and uh, looking forward to working with our colleagues and ensuring that we move these agendas forward. With that, I will go ahead and pass it over to uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, Representative Herr. Now, just to start, uh, so we, we are nearly two years into a global crisis. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I'm Representative Frazier, District 45A, and I'll be talking about our public safety approach. So we're nearly two years into a global crisis. Depression is up, DUIs are up, drug use is up, and access to resources that help are delayed. These are only some of the factors that are contributing to our nation's rise in crime. Factual data tells us that crime is on the rise across our nation in states like Mississippi, where punitive measures are in full effect, but also in more progressive-minded states like Oregon. What that tells us is that this isn't a rise, this isn't a crime wave that any of our criminal justice partners in Minnesota have created. So our response must be dynamic and innovative. It cannot be based on unproven and ineffective strategies. Recently, my GOP colleagues have provided ideas to address our uptick in crime. I've been very disappointed because it seems as if they dusted off their old playbook and offered failing methods as solutions to address public safety in 2022. Now I'll tell you, my journey from the south side of Chicago and in Inglewood community, one of the toughest communities in the city, and you're one of the toughest in the nation. To being a representative from New Hope, it has given me a deep appreciation for public safety and what safety and what safe communities mean for better overall outcomes. Our lived experiences provide us with incredible perspective and empathy. So when my colleague, Rep. Edelson, calls me to discuss carjackings that are impacting her community, I understand the anxiety that her neighbors are experiencing. And when Rep. Keeler and Rep. McQuart and I discuss the need for resources for their community, I understand why we need to invest in poverty-stricken communities in greater Minnesota, just as we need to invest in those communities in the metro, in the communities that Chair Moran, Rep. Gomez, Rep. Hassan, Rep. Baje, Rep. Hollins, Rep. Jay Jung, and the rest of my posse colleagues advocate for. This is why I'm chief author of the Proven Public Safety Solutions Bill. With the support of my posse colleagues, it is a $100 million proposal that will provide funding to make effective community crime prevention models permanent, fund proven and effective law enforcement methods, and increase accountability and transparency between officers and the communities they serve, which will lead to increased intelligence gathering that will improve the rate at which crimes are solved. I expect and I am looking forward to feedback from all stakeholders. I am also offering and encouraging Senator Limmer or someone from GOP Senate leadership to work with us as we craft policy to create a public safety framework that works for all Minnesotans. I am imploring my GOP colleagues to refrain from offering simplistic solutions to complex and nuanced problems. Those simplistic approaches will not provide or ensure the best long-term outcomes for Minnesota. It will take all hands on deck to to build the public safety framework that will create a Minnesota that is safe for all Minnesotans for the next several decades. And I, along with my posse colleagues, plan to keep working to invest and advocate for a public safety framework that keeps all Minnesotans safe. And I'll pass it on to Representative Baidze. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here with us today. My name is Esther Agbaje and I represent House District 59B, which covers downtown and parts of North Minneapolis. And so I'm really glad to be here to lead the House Posse Caucus this session with Representative Athena Holland. As you've heard from our colleagues, we will be leading in this session to make significant efforts to address housing needs, close the education disparities, and create holistic public safety for BIPOC Minnesotans and all Minnesotans. To many of us, these are foundational needs that require levels of attention from our state government, state government that we do not usually see. The 2022 session 
is a year to make lasting investments in each of these areas that allows more Minnesotans to lead thriving lives. When we focus on addressing the inequities in our systems, everyone does better. And we will be working with our colleagues and health leadership to ensure bills that move forward are anti-racist and address systemic inequities specific to different BIPOC communities. We will also be working with the governor's office to make sure that we are making life better for more people. At the end of the day, it can't only be us doing this work. It takes partnership. And we encourage all of those working to make Minnesota a better place to live, to engage with the Posse Caucus on those efforts. Thank you, and we'll now take some questions. Hello, reporters. Um, if you would like to get on the list for questions, you can simply use the raise hand function or put a message in the chat. Uh, Walker Orenstein. Hey, everybody. Thanks for taking the time today. Um, hey, I wanted to ask, I wanted to take the temperature of you all on a couple proposals on public safety from the governor and from Senate Republicans, um, specifically around attracting new police officers. There's been a push by both the governor and Senate Republicans on like recruiting efforts. And also I wanted to ask about the governor's $300 million plan for um, local government public safety needs. And he said it sort of could be used for adding new cops or you know, mental health response, co-responders, a homeless shelter, anything that um, those local governments are kind of interested in. So I just thought I'd, I wanted to take your temperature on that. I know you've talked a lot about your specific plans, but I also just wanted to hear you out if, you, if you're interested at all in helping with um, trying to recruit new law enforcement or, or adding money for new cops or other public safety measures through local government aid. Walker, thanks for that question. I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, my colleagues don't mind. Anyone can add if they if they have to. So uh, to the to the issue, I'll start with the issue of the the yeah, either recruitment pieces and the retention pieces. So the bill that I am carrying um, that my posse colleagues and other uh, DFL cohorts are supporting that bill also addresses the recruitment and retention piece. It, it, it addresses it in a way to establish a task force that would bring together stakeholders that would be community members that would be law enforcement, uh, maybe legislators to provide recommendations on what's the best way to expand and allow for a more opportunities for individuals to get involved in the progression of, of law enforcement. And I, I would say part of that emphasis would be looking at how do we best reflect the communities that an officer serves, and also how do we make sure communities that uh, maybe are not so diverse have diverse officers? Because as we know, we have transient populations that travel through those communities, and they should see officers that reflect their um, particular backgrounds. Um, so I think we're going to be open to look, we'll be looking at uh, any way we can to look at those recruitment and retention efforts. I think that's fair. I think we have a lot of professions, uh, pr licensed professions that are that have a dearth of candidates and particularly quality candidates. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, and then, then the piece with the with the resources and the budget proposal from the governor, um, it also aligns the dollar amounts in the the topics for those dollar amounts align with some of the things, with many of the things we're trying to do in this public safety proposal we have. So as vice chair of the committee and, and, and on behalf of Chair Mariani, I know we'll be looking at that as we go through the, uh, through the legislative process here this session. So we're gonna be open to looking at things and taking that feedback. And I think that's where, that's kind of where we are right now, but we haven't seen much detail from our GOP colleagues. And we'll also be looking at the detailed proposals that are coming from the governor as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Frazier and Walker. Um, Peter Callahan, you would like to ask a question? Hi, thanks. Again, I don't want to hog it, but if nobody else has a question. Um, and this may be for Representative Hassan, but not necessarily. Um, I know the, there are members of the Posse Caucus who are supportive of the Page Amendment. I also know there are members of the Posse Caucus who oppose the Page Amendment. And perhaps uh, I've answered my own question, but does the Posse Caucus have a collective opinion or position on the Page Amendment? Uh, 
Um, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, you answered your own question. <laughs> Uh, some members are supporting and others have some concerns and we're working with them to address these concerns. Thank you. Uh, Brianna Birschbach. Hey, thanks for taking my question. You know, it, it looks like um, obviously part of the work of the Posse Caucus will be introducing and developing proposals. I, I'm curious if anyone can address how much um, work you think you'll be doing, you know, potentially kind of pushing back or calling out proposals that you think would hurt communities of color this session um, as they're kind of coming up. And is that going to be part of the, the group's work? I'm happy to take that question. Um, you know, our agenda this session is really to make sure that all of the bills that move forward have an equity component to them. We want to make sure that whatever people are pushing and whatever rises to the top is not going to be, is not going to have a harmful effect on, pe on people of color. So while we will be putting forward proposals that we know should be um, enhancing the lives of more people um, to the extent that we do need to um, address issues that we see in other bills, we will be speaking about. Any other questions? Um, Tom Gita? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, this, uh, this could be for anyone, but maybe the two chairs could uh, address it. It's not a legislative question per se, but I just wanted to get a sense on, on their views on how the redistricting uh, process is going. Uh, any of them uh, impacted so far? Just a general sense of what is going on. Um, I'm happy to to jump in here, but I think um, you know Representative Vang might have more to this point as she is on the redistricting committee. Um, at, at this point, we're still in the process of redistricting. Um, we don't really know what the final outcome is going to be. Um, as you know, it, it will. The chances that we come to an agreement on this is is pretty slim right now. Um, it looks like there are some potential small shifts, but not anything that um, that looks truly detrimental. Um, but I think that um, we'll continue to monitor the situation, and um, you know, as we come up on on the date of February fifteenth, we're all acutely aware of what this might mean for us and our communities. Um, and especially BIPOC communities who um, have potentially greater need for connection to their um, representatives in order to make sure that they're being heard and, um, you know, to make sure that they are in connection with us at the Capitol. And so we are definitely aware of what those shifts in lines might be for our BIPOC communities, and we're, we're keeping track of it. So thank you. And I don't know if, yeah, Representative Vang has something to add. Thank you, Mr. Gita, for your question. Uh, I, as a member of the redistricting committee, the House DFL in the committee, we have passed a map. Um, and I believe, um, you know, the House Republicans have also presented their maps as well to the Senate. Uh, we all know that February 15th is a hard deadline. Uh, we have opened the doors to communicate, to work on things. Uh, so far, we have not heard much from, the, uh, from our colleagues from the other side of the aisle. Um, so as, as of now, we are, um, you know, the courts are, are still, uh, they're in the process right now um, and uh, we'll see what happens. Next question goes to John Croman. Hello, this kind of might stray into the kind of the culture wars type arena, but um, the, the Department of Education is now doing the rulemaking on the social studies curriculum and Senate Republicans have hinted that they may want to do something uh, to, to alter that. Um, I mean, I know it's, it's kind of in the executive branch right now, but as legislators, I mean, is there any, do you see any reason to be worried about the fact that uh, that social study curriculum is including more information about um, racial disparities and things things that are part of our history. Uh, 
John, if I can, are you are you asking if we think it's problematic that those things are being included in, in the uh, social studies curriculum or proposed social studies social studies curriculum? Uh, Cedric, um, I, I mean, uh, uh, Representative Frazier, um, no I, worries. I, <laughs> I, I, uh, um, I guess I, I need to state it better. I, mean, I guess, do you have any opinions on why it's appropriate that the social studies uh, curriculum reflect um, some of the new information, some of the, some of these, I guess, have that, that the curriculum tell uh, students more about uh, injustices and and why some of the current disparities exist. Well, I think it's critical. I think it's important. I think it's critical because we are we are educating global citizens, um, and, and and one of the most important things about educating global citizens is they should be aware of what's happening, particularly within their their own country, uh, but as well as how the there is an intersection about what's happened um, throughout our world history in other countries that have had an impact on some of the disparities and issues that are that are happening right now today in our country. I think is is. I think it's very important for those things to be factual, to, to provide the facts, um, educate our students in that factual way. And this is really what it's about. It's not about any type of propaganda or, or, um, or campaign. This is really about making sure our students are, are very well versed in history and facts so they can be critical thinkers and they can be global citizens. I think we're doing a disservice when we try to shield our students from the facts um, as, they, as they were around the world. Um, if we want to continue to, if we want to be anywhere in the world as leaders on education and for our kids to be able to participate in this global society and global community um, and in the workforce, they have to be well versed in what the, what the actual facts of our history are. And I think that's absolutely critical and I think it's important. Um, and I'm, I'm proud of the fact that uh, MDE and, and their stakeholders that, that they've gone out because they've gone out and they've got information from tons of folks through the rules making process and through um, through surveys and through um, study groups and focus groups and they're gathering that information. I'm proud of the way they're doing that because I think this is what many of our parents we want our kids to be educated um, around the facts and we want our kids to be prepared to step into a global society um, as they age into adulthood and go into the workforce. So I think it's vitally important. Thank you. And I'll just add a, a little bit to that as well and uh, agree with everything that Representative uh, Frazier lifted up there. And, you know, as we talk about um, historical wrongs and injustices, we also have to be cognizant of the fact that um, those injustices are continuing today. Um, those are injustices that I experienced um, within uh, our, our, our public school system and within just our society. They are injustices that my children are experiencing as well. And so we're not just talking about the impact of the historical legacy of these things, but the fact that they are realities um, for uh, many uh, students of color across, um, uh, across the state as well. And I just wanted to uh, also give a chance for Vice Chair Hassan to also uh, weigh in as well. Uh, thank you, Chair Richardson. I, I think um, social studies curriculum is important because um, we haven't been telling the truth about our history. Um, I immigrated from Africa. I came from a continent that was all Black, uh, with Black doctors, Black teachers, Black engineers. You know, most of the people were black and I came to the US and you know, people who look like me were reduced to their mention in history was slavery, civil rights and nothing else. I had to, as an adult going to college, I had to take uh, African-American studies to learn about the history of African-American, African-Americans in this country. And it's really, you know, uh, robbing our young people the, the, the truth about the world and the truth about what we have done and the truth about, you know, the genocide of Native Americans, the slave, enslavement of African Americans, and also the contribution. We talk about all the, all these things in a, uh, you know, blood here, blood there, but we don't talk about the contribution that all non-Europeans have contributed to this country. So I think that all students will benefit from um, if our education and our social studies and our history is not centered around Eurocentric view of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. Can I just add one thing really quick? I know we've like had a lot of responses, but I do just want to say really quick that as we have this conversation around social studies that 
um, that our friends in the media uh, help us enable to understand that social studies is not the same as critical race theory. And I think that uh, some of our colleagues across the aisle would like to paint that being able to have an inclusive uh, curriculum, which uh, introduces people to understanding others that are different than them, that we remember that that is not the same thing as uh, the narrative that's trying to be created around this particular topic and that we do not teach some of these topics in high school because we haven't even given them the foundation to have these discussions. And so um, for us to be careful about how we talk about this subject, and I think that it's important for us to see what the curriculum is going to look like and for us to be then thinking about in the lens of how this is getting used within our K through 12 education. And so I just would like to just caution us a little bit around that so that we don't continue to conflate the issues and put that out into the uh, in for consumption for other people because they are very different things. Yes, the uh, St. Paul Public Schools has uh, has been doing a pilot uh, project project with courses on what they call critical ethnic studies. It just the word critical in the course title was enough to get people to troll me when I <laughs> when I did a story about it. So it's uh, yeah, it's, people are um, are really pouncing uh, and kind of trying to blow things up. It seems like, but that's more of a commentary than a question, I guess. Back to you guys. Any more questions? Okay, we look like we're good. Um, Chair Baje, Chair Allens, would you like to say a closing statement? I just want to say thank you everyone for being here. I appreciate your questions and we will continue to update you um, as we move forward through this session. So thank you.